Two weeks after Ohio congressional candidate Nina Turner aired an ad promoting Medicare for All, pharmaceutical lobbyists and lawmakers largely funded by Big Pharma came together to try to block Turner's path to victory. How surprising. According to the Daily Poster, the day after the ad surfaced, corporate lobbyists held a Washington fundraiser for Turner's primary opponent, Chantel Brown. And as David notes here, Turner's intensified push for Medicare for All comes as one million Ohio residents lost their employer-sponsored health care. The founder of the Daily Poster, David Sirota, joins us now to discuss. David, uh, first of all, great, great reporting. Um, what do you think this uh, says about Nina Turner's willingness to continue talking about Medicare for All when the political establishment has said that it is uh, a political loser and we will, we will punish you financially if you continue? Well, first of all, I think it reflects her understanding of her district. I mean, that is a congressional district that she's running in, in which the last members of Congress who've represented it for the last 30 years have supported Medicare for All. Uh, there was also some polling back in 2018, which showed that Medicare for All is wildly popular in uh, the region of Ohio where she's running. So I think it, one, shows that she's in touch with where uh, that district happens to be on the issue. And also, secondly, I mean, it obviously shows that she is a committed leader on this issue and she's willing to to have the fight. I mean, there. let's be clear, there is an easy way for her to not have that fight, for her to simply not talk about Medicare for all. She's running against an opponent who has uh, made some critical comments about Medicare for all. Uh, her, you know, her top leading uh, primary opponent, Chantel Brown, has said uh, some, some critical things about that. So she could have avoided the issue, but she actually leaned in. And I think what it says about her, you know, obviously I, I, I admire Nina, but I think what it says about her is that she's really committed to that specific issue uh, in a deep way. And by the way, it should be added that the ad that she aired, she talked about it in very personal terms about how her family's struggle with health care bills uh, informed her support of that. So I think it also, uh, for those voters in that district, it, it shows her personal connection to the issue as opposed to it just being sort of a, a box checked uh, on a on kind of a policy agenda. This raises a really interesting cost-benefit equation in that obviously there's a cost because you have pharma pouring money and help to your opponent, but we've covered on here a couple of times that after uh, Chantal Brown gets establishment endorsements, whether it's Hillary Clinton um, or anyone else, Nina Turner's fundraising spikes. So my question to you, David, would be, how, do you think this hurts Chantal Brown? Well, I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, look, Certainly, uh, Chantel Brown needs resources to run. Nina Turner is the grassroots funded candidate. So if you're running against a Nina Turner, you need to find money somewhere. And I guess the Chantel Brown campaign has decided that they're going to try to find it in the traditional establishment corporate aligned sources. Uh, so that is going to create uh, a, a more parity when it comes to, to spending. Uh, Chantel Brown may ultimately be able to outspend uh, Nina Turner. But I think you're right. We're now living in a, in a political environment in which they're, they're, with the rise of grassroots fundraising, uh, it makes it easier uh, for candidates to take positions like Nina Turner is taking, uh, knowing that there is now an alternative source of fundraising uh, that could uh, reward and boost her uh, for taking a progressive position. And speaking of that progressive position, let, let's play that ad so, can see, so people can see what we're talking about. Something that continues to haunt me to this day is my mother dying at the young age of 42 years old. No insurance, no money in the bank. So when I fight for Medicare for all, I'm fighting for my mama, who's not here, and working class people who need to have health care as a right, not a privilege. The poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class should live a good life. Wealth should not dictate whether or not you have access to health care. I'm Nina Turner, and I approve this message. Now, what's also interesting is that at the very end of that, uh, she triggered kind of a small subset of Twitter.com. <laughs> By using the phrase "access to healthcare," that your wealth should not, um, you know, should not dictate your your access to healthcare. Did, did you did you did you notice that? And and, and if so, what did you think about that that kind of odd reaction? 
Well, look, I, th- I think what, what that says is that, that understandably over the last 30, 40 years, uh, some folks have become very suspicious uh, of a Democratic Party establishment that uses uh, phrases like access to health care rather than simply health care. Uh, I think that, 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 that y- you understand that people who follow this are suspicious uh, of that phrasing. But I would say this. Nina Turner is not airing a Medicare for all ad to parse words, right? If she wanted to air an ad uh, parsing her position on health care, she wouldn't have made the entire ad about Medicare for all. I Look, I worked with Nina Turner on Bernie Sanders' campaign. I mean, she she is a an absolute leader of the Medicare for all movement. So if anybody's questioning her commitment to that, it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's a big eye roll for me. Uh, and I think, again, I think that the fact that she put it in personal terms is a really, really powerful message. And the most bizarre part of this in that congressional uh, race is why Chantel Brown would come out uh, and make critical comments of Medicare when, again, it is a district which has been which has been represented by Medicare for all proponents for the last 30 years. So it's hardly a radical position, a Nina Turner's position, to support Medicare for all in that particular district. I always think back to, I think it was a net roots in 2017 that I was covering, and there was this immense energy at that time. I think like Randy Bryce had spoken and he had just released an ad kind of similar to this one. And there's this immense energy behind the idea that some of these populist, but populist leftist ideas were playing really well in the middle of the country. Um, and we're actually playing really well, surprisingly, to the media establishment um, in ways that Bernie Sanders would continue to do well in, in 2020 and in that primary race. Can you talk to us about why you think it is is that from the legacy media's perspective, it's still, it's still so puzzling for them to see people who support Medicare for all, and maybe this is informing some of Chantel Brown's decision making when it comes to talking about health care policy. Why, why is it that those ideas um, are attractive and aren't sort of like successfully tarred with the socialist label? Well, I, look, I think the the elite uh, uh, Washington, New York centric media uh, is used to being immersed in a in a frankly a, a kind of corporate sculpted debate in which uh, popular policies are portrayed as somehow radical and fringe. Uh, po- and of course, that fits the agenda of what kind of the corporate sector wants, which is nothing to fundamentally change. So I think then you see the coverage uh, of somebody like Nina Turner, and she's taking a position for a very popular policy. And there's a little bit of like, wait, how could she do this? Or, you know, this is so strange. Or is she really out on the fringe here? When in fact, when you look at the, she may be out on the fringe when it comes to the elite political discourse, but she's not out on the fringe when it comes uh, to where voters actually are. So I think it speaks to the disconnect between where the voters of this country are uh, and where the media may be. Now, one, one asterisk on that, which is to say that I also think that the uh, elite corporate media internalizes the presumption that if a politician takes even a popular position for a popular program like Medicare for All, they are going to get outspent, spent into the ground uh, by the corporate forces that don't want that. And I think it's it's certainly true that, as we've discussed, uh, big money will mobilize against candidates like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean anymore that those candidates taking those positions can't fight back. Nina Turner grassroots fundraising, I think, speaks to a new and different dynamic uh, that is making it easier for candidates to take wildly popular positions, even knowing that big money is going to spend against them. Yeah, and as, as we talked about earlier in the show, DMFI's super PAC jumped into this race yesterday, and uh, we, we don't know how much they're going to spend, but if it's, if it's true to past form over the next five weeks, they could easily drop a, a, a more than a million dollars or, or significantly more than a million dollars between now and Election Day. And, and a lot of that is tied in with the corporate and democratic es- establishment, despite the name of the PAC. Well, you should know, uh, Mark Melman, who uh, helps run that PAC, Mark Melman listed on his website, uh, he has worked with the Pharmaceutical Researchers and Manufacturers Association, which is the big uh, pharmaceutical lobby in Washington. Uh, you've got the uh, some of the Democrats who take the most money from pharma uh, backing Nina Turner's opponent. So all of it show, is, paints a portrait of Nina Turner taking a position uh, and, and leaning into her position in support of Medicare for all and the healthcare industry uh, deliberately fighting back to try to send a message. And, you know, it's always worth remembering that voters don't fall along the same partisan lines that the media sort of tries to force on them. Like they, they sort of try to force these, this partisan framework onto voters in a way that just doesn't ultimately really reflect what's happening. 
Agreed. I mean, I don't I, I, I you know, I haven't seen any polling in Nina Turner's district, but, you know, where do people see Medicare for all falling in that district, falling on the liberal to conservative uh, uh, kind of continuum? I think when it comes to a policy like this, it doesn't necessarily, to your point, it doesn't necessarily fall in voters' minds along that continuum. And I think, you know, it is in, in a lot of ways in, in the middle of that health care crisis in Ohio, in a lot of ways, it's, it's not a liberal or conservative issue. It's just common sense. Right. David Sirota, thanks so much for joining us. Great reporting. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. We'll be back with more Rising right after this.